Good morning, everybody. Wow, we've packed in a lot this morning. Uh, welcome to the final session before lunch. I'm Omar Khan. I'm CTO here at Common Sense. And before welcoming our panel, I just want to talk to you for a second about our privacy program initiative. So about five years ago, Jim Siegel, the IT director of Fairfax County in Virginia, one of the largest school districts in the country, accosted our head of education and said to him, we districts face such a big problem around privacy. Why doesn't common sense get in and help us a little bit? So we said yes. Jim Sire said yes, privacy is exciting. We'll, we'll, we're trying to help you out. So we started putting together a consortium of districts, first 10, then 20, then 50, 100 when we got funding a few years ago. It's now 350. And put together a 150-point evaluation of every product in the market against every privacy law and regulation that there is. We vetted it with Davis Polk, with all these privacy experts. We had a former FCC commissioner make sure that every single question was tied in to a law and a statute. And we came out with a whole evaluation rubric. And we started evaluating hundreds of applications for the school system. And we found very quickly, and we launched this about 18 months ago, we even boiled it down to 35 questions, that within about 15, 18 months, we went from 5% of the products in the blue category, our highest tier, to 22%. So by working with industry effectively and talking to companies beforehand, we actually have been able to make great change. And I think it's been a very good example of how actually real vendor engagement and working together looks you know, for really changing the lives for kids. Uh, we are about 18 to 24 months from bringing AI to this, from actually automating the reading of privacy policies. I know we all, no one likes to read a privacy policy, but machines, well, they don't have feelings, so they can certainly do that. Uh, we also are thinking of bringing this to consumer products. Believe it or not, 40% of the products in the educational system today are consumer products. By the time we're ready, it's probably going to be over 50%. So we have worked with a lot of the companies behind the scenes, and our strategy has been when we read someone's privacy policy, we actually give it to them completely annotated and say, before we go online and publish our evaluation, we'd like to talk to you about it. Do you have any comments? Have we got something wrong? Do you want to make any changes? And about a third of the companies actually change their policies working with us. Over half the companies change their policies you know, to the points that we've made even without working with us. So we've actually been able to have real impact here. And even as I'm talking to you, we're working with a number of companies uh, trying to get them to change their features and change their policies. So our program is led by uh, Gerard Kelly in the back, and Jill Bronfman is also here. It's a four-person team, and we think it's one of the smallest but perhaps most impactful teams here at Common Sense. We also have a lot of thought leadership. Uh, today we are releasing our first report on what are the privacy harms. So at commonsense.org forward slash privacy harms, you can download a report which really talks about what are all the issues uh, that people face around privacy. Why is it dangerous to have your privacy information or your kids' privacy information in particular you know, taken up? Or you know, what are all the issues around that? And we have a lot of information there. We publish reports annually on encryption, on ad tracking, on how different companies and different policies match up to this question set. And we'll publish another one in, uh, in June. So we really are trying to move the world forward. We estimate about 20 million kids are now in a much safer space, besides us, us adults uh, as well, because of this work. And we look forward to uh, continuing it. We're also very thankful to our funders, the Michael, Susan, and uh, Dell Foundation, the Gates Foundation, the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative for supporting this work over the years. And with that, I'd like to welcome our panel, run by uh, Levi uh, Samagase from the San Jose Mercury News. There is also uh, Alicia Gray from the Mozilla Foundation, Eli Luberoff from Desmos, Jacob Rogers from Wikipedia, and Marina Taylor from Code.org. So please, okay. thank you. Good morning. Um, so I'm Levy, and um, as a tech reporter for the Mercury News, I have written a lot about companies whose uh, products and offerings have raised all kinds of privacy concerns, um, you know, sort of highlighting why uh, designing for privacy is important. Uh, the co uh, common sense has brought 
these organizations and companies here because of um, your thoughtful approach uh, to privacy. And um, so with that, I would like for each of you to please introduce yourselves and just a quick uh, summary of what your companies do in case some of the, the um, audience here doesn't know. So let's start sure. with you. So my name is Jacob Rogers. I'm a senior legal counsel at the Wikimedia Foundation. Um, Wikimedia hosts Wikipedia, uh, and the mission of the organization is to make the world's knowledge uh, freely available to everyone. Uh, and we do that through hosting Wikipedia as well as various sister projects that make encyclopedia articles uh, as well as sources and other documents uh, available to the public uh, and are open to everyone all around the world to uh, edit and contribute. Great, thank you. Uh, so I'm Marina Taylor. I lead the product team at Code.org, and our organization is focused on expanding access to computer science to schools, uh, and especially focusing on expanding access to women and underrepresented minorities in the field. Uh, so we develop curriculum and tools, we uh, train teachers to be computer science teachers, and we do advocacy work uh, so that the policies change to support this. Alicia. Okay, thank you. Uh, my name is Alicia Gray. I'm the senior manager on the trust and security team at Mozilla. <coughs> Excuse me. And um, we made the Firefox internet browser, and that's what we're best known for. Um, our mission is very similar to um, Wikimedia's, which is to really create an open and free internet that's available to anyone and everyone, regardless of where you are in the world. And I'm Eli, I'm the founder and CEO at a company called Desmos that makes math software. So we're best known for, does anyone remember your like TI-83 graphing calculator, <laughs> handheld calculator? Um, so 30 years later, you still have to spend 100 bucks on those, but um, 31 years later, today, you don't have to do that anymore. Uh, so founded this company about seven years ago, make um, free software for uh, helping every student learn math and love learning math. Great, thanks. Um, so let's start with you, Eli. Um, can you talk a little bit about um, Desmos, which is the only um, for-profit company on this panel, um, but you do, you have talked about your um, approach to privacy, you don't sell ads. Um, how does that fit in with your business model? Uh, so education is a super interesting space where a lot of the for-profits act like non-profits and a lot of the non-profits act like for-profits. Um, I don't know if anyone knows that like College Board and ACT are both uh, non-profits, for example. Um, so we, we started with a very deep mission focus and almost everyone at the team follows that. We decided to be a for-profit for like really practical reasons. Um, we weren't planning to fundraise uh, from like grants and there's a lot of structural things that make being a for-profit a lot easier. But in fact, all of the values are really similar to, to the other folks on this panel, where we are here to help students, where we um, have a deep commitment to do what we think is the right thing to do in classrooms, where our team has more teachers than it has programmers on staff. Um, and so for us, it was kind of a, a no-brainer to come up with a business model that didn't require us to both charge students and teachers and to not profit from their data and to not profit from advertising to them. And um, so what is that? How do you make money? Great question. <laughs> <laughs> that was the question. Uh, and, and it's a really good one, I think, to ask every company. We, we encourage this every time we're at a conference with teachers and they like a product to say, like, where's your money coming from? Because it's either from like venture funding, um, which could dry up and then the product will disappear. Um, it's from having a real business model, or it's from doing something slimy with data. Like, pretty much those are the three choices. Um, ours are that we license our technology through an API to textbook companies and to assessment companies. So, um, like Pearson and McGraw-Hill and the College Board and the ACT and a bunch of um, state exams and those kinds of things embed our API inside of their uh, technology. Great, okay. Um, so a question to you and to um, code.org. Um, there are lots of special rules and regulations um, that companies must follow when dealing with children's data. Um, can you talk a little bit about that, um, how you approach that, um, and then maybe code.org, uh, you know, if you would just talk a little bit about how you protect kids' privacy. Sure, so I can start with just our approach, and I can talk a little bit about the laws. So um, I'd say there's three words that would come to mind, transparency, minimization and education, and I'm sure folks up here would probably agree with all those. Uh, so minimize how much data you collect so that 
data you don't have, data you can't lose. Uh, transparency, uh, we are very wordy in our privacy policy, for example. We are very explicit about what data we collect and why and how we use it. Uh, if you read our privacy policy, you'll be very well informed. Um, and lastly, education. We are an education company, and not only that, but we are educating uh, kids in computer science. And privacy is a key aspect of computer science and how do you uh, security and safety measures in using data online. And so we believe uh, edu educating uh, everybody, including students, especially students, um, around privacy uh, measures is critical. And so our lessons, uh, we have lessons on privacy in our embedded in our curriculum, but also even if you read our privacy policy, we'll teach you about privacy directly in there. We'll explain what a tracking pixel is. We won't just mention it, we'll actually tell you what it is. And so you'll see those kinds of things uh, thrown uh, throughout the, the work that we do. Uh, in terms of the laws, for anybody that's working in our industry, we know things, you know, COPPA and FERPA and SOPIPA, those are great uh, regulations and we absolutely follow those and are governed by those. Um, the way we think about it is those are the minimum bar and that's the thing to, uh, it's great to do those, but we should be looking outside of just the minimum bar and what else can we do in our approach to ensure the privacy of students. Uh, and so some examples of things that we do uh, is we don't store student email addresses. We collect them so that you can actually log in, but we have a hash, a one-way hash that we cannot undo uh, that we can't access, and so we can never email student, students, and that's a trade-off that we've decided to make. Uh, but again, back to the minimization principle, what data you don't have, you can't lose. Um, another example is, you know, some of these things are small and simple, but uh, when you create an account in code.org, rather than asking you for your birth date, we ask for you for age. Or rather than asking for your first and last name, we ask for display name. Those are small things that you do in the design of your product that can lead uh, and, and help protect students' privacy. And then, Eli, you, do, you guys do some of that, too. Yeah, so, so one of the things that we noticed really early on is that there's a few things that you can do with our software that requires having an account. But most people aren't doing those things. Like generally what you're doing is the equivalent of taking out your calculator, graphing something, and putting it away. Um, and so we uh, decided to for sure not enforce that you create an account to use our software, but also to collect just as little as we possibly can, this minimization idea. So like we truncate IP addresses in our logs to make sure that we couldn't get back that. We got rid of Google Analytics so that you're not being tracked around the web when you use our site. And so by coming to it, if you choose to not make an account, we collect as little as we possibly um, can. And, and one of the things that has been really exciting to us is how rapidly this space is changing, um, in part because of the work of Common Sense, in part because of things like GDPR, where mm -hmm. we're actually internalizing some of those external costs of collecting data. Like in GDPR, you have to uh, report every piece of non-essential data that you collect, and people have to opt into it, and you need new systems for doing it. And so it's actually now cheaper for a company to not collect it at all than to do that in, in some ways. And so it's really a lot of positive stuff happening from these FERPA, from COPA, from SOPIPA, from GDPR, um, from the common sense reports, from the data privacy agreements schools are asking for that are actually internalizing some of these, these costs, which is super exciting to us. Great. Um, let's turn to the non, uh, let's turn to Mozilla and to Wikimedia. Um, can you guys talk about how important it is based on, you know, because of what your products are, that your users know that you've thought through um, your privacy policies and that they're important to you. You know, what, what kind of outreach do you do and how important is it to be transparent about your policies? Um, do you want to go, go ahead? Sure. Yeah, so it, we see that as one of the, the core parts of our effort. Um, there was, for example, when the uh, original news about the NSA spying broke several years ago, there was a, a study that actually came out that found that people were more afraid to look up controversial topics or political topics online. Uh, and so we, we know that if people think they are being observed, they will be hesitant to read about different things and to sort of put themselves out there uh, on the internet. So for us, it's a core thing that we are protecting people's privacy in that way. Um, and we try to make it very clear to people that they don't need to give us data. So if you are reading Wikipedia, uh, anyone can do that from basically any connection. Uh, and the only thing we get is the, the bare minimum technical information required to 
let your computer uh, you know, connect to our servers and actually read an article. Uh, and even that we keep for uh, as little time as we can manage just to keep everything operating. Um, even for people who are making an account, we don't need your um, real name, for example. We found that people can edit Wikipedia under a pseudonym and do great work, uh, and it's not necessary for people to give us their personal information. We'll accept an email if you want it for you know, password recovery, for example, but otherwise we uh, show people when they are trying to participate in the site that they don't need to give us a lot of information in the first place uh, to be able to contribute to an encyclopedia. Um, and just to remind people, Wikimedia, Wikipedia, it has never run ads, is that correct? Or Correct, yeah. So we don't, we don't do any kind of profiling of users or, or running ads at all. We're entirely like nonprofit, small donation funded, um, and the whole project is written by volunteers who are just coming to the sites and participating out of their uh, desire to contribute to knowledge in their free time. <laughs> and Alicia, do you want to talk about Mozilla? Sure. So um, Mozilla has been very open and transparent. We're an open source browser, which means our code is open. Anybody can look at our code. You can take a copy of the code, and you can go and take that and design something yourself if you want. So we are open and transparent, even down to you know, all of the little ones and zeros that make up that browser so that anybody can check to see what we're doing. So if we say we don't collect something, you can look into the code if you're so inclined and see, are we saying, are we doing what we say that we do? So that is really important to the core of who we are, and that's been part of Mozilla's fabric since day one, is an offshoot of Netscape, um, if you remember back that far. <laughs> um, so, but we also live by a standard, um, a couple of things. We have some data privacy principles that really are the fabric of how we design and handle all of our data collection. And so these are basically five kind of things you would think would be normal practice, but they're not. Um, so for instance, the data minimization, as you've heard before. So we collect the bare minimum. So if you use the browser, the Firefox browser, you don't need to create an account or anything like that. You can just use the browser. We collect the bare minimum we need to render whatever it is you need to see. So you know, we have to know the kinds of you know, systems people are using. But you don't even have to give that to us. You can opt out of that. We leave it right up there for you to decide. Tell me nothing or tell me what you want. And that's totally fine for us. Um, we limit access, so only very small teams get access to this data. It is um, de-identified where possible, so if we, can, if we can strip off last digits in the IP, then we will do that. Um, we maintain it for a limited amount of time. Uh, we audit to make sure that our retention, if we say it's you know, 45 days for some reason, then we audit to make sure we're sticking to our 45 days, and that's all readily available to people. Um, so that's that's really core to how we work. So all of you have talked about um, collecting as little data as possible. Um, what, what kind of information do you collect? Is it, is it all um, you know, anonymous? And with whom do you share that data, if any? Let's start. Uh, sure. <laughs> so I would. I think Wikipedia tries to strike a balance between the work that is done uh, in the public and then the information that should be kept private. So when we talk about like information collection, as I was mentioning, we don't need people's real names. We don't need any more than the technical information they need to connect to the sites. On the other hand, when people are uh, editing the sites and contributing to articles, uh, they write something and the Wikipedia software creates uh, a history of every edit that has ever been made to an article, and so anyone can see how an article has been built up, the different contributors uh, and their pseudonyms who have contributed to it, and you can know uh, how something came to be and how it changed over time, including you know, if there were mistakes that were made and got corrected or, or anything like that. So everyone in the public is able to transparently understand the content and how it got there on the sites, whereas each individual contributor is allowed to maintain their privacy and can contribute to different projects uh, without needing to you know, give up their real information. Uh, and then for readers, uh, the site is just, as I mentioned, generally available. And so you can read about anything. And we work very hard to make sure that you're able to do so uh, privately. And we kind of think of, of Wikipedia in many ways as uh, analogous to a modern library, where people should be able to read about whatever topic they want to read about uh, without worrying that someone else might find out about that. Uh, so code.org 
uh, just as uh, we talked about with Desmos, uh, can be used without an account. Uh, you can access the courses uh, as a student. Um, but if you want to have progress, if you want to be able to track your progress, if you want a teacher that wants to be able to track a student's progress, you do have to create an account. And in that world, the thing you need to create is you know, display name uh, and your age. Uh, and we can talk about why the age is important, but there's different things we do based on the age of the student. Um, but then also we end up tracking things like what lesson they completed and uh, when and the, the, the code that they wrote because those are all the things that enable and empower the educator, the teacher in the classroom to support their students. And so um, there is a, definitely a list of uh, data points that we collect and track. Uh, and uh, as I mentioned, our wordy privacy policy, we actually explicitly talk about those things in our privacy policy so you can see and read uh, all of those things. And we're also open source, so you can go check our code uh, <laughs> and see if what we say is true. Um, in terms of who we share it with, so clearly the teacher has access to the student data uh, if, she, if the teacher created that account in the, the classroom section, um, if that's the thing that the teacher had uh, decided. Um, otherwise, we, first of all, we don't share any data with, for financial gain. We don't do any advertising. We don't sell our data. Um, that's definitely a line we would never cross. Um, the, the data that we uh, sometimes share, there's some opportunities we have with external third-party researchers, uh, like educational institutions, uh, that we sometimes share de-identified and aggregated data so that they can analyze our, um, our progress and we can in, uh, improve our product. And so in those cases, we uh, make sure that we sign an agreement with them for uh, ensure, first of all, it's de-identified and, de and aggregated, but also uh, they have to um, write in, uh, put in writing that they're not gonna try to uh, re-identify based on the data. Uh, and so those are sometimes the limited partnerships that we end up sharing data with. And then we also, of course, have aggregated reports on our annual report shares the impact that we have uh, and broken down by demographics, but it's never about specific individuals. Great. Mm. Uh, yes, so for us on the browser, again, you can, you can use it. You don't need an account to do that. We collect very minimal technical data to make it run. Um, if you can create accounts, we do have accounted services. It depends on what it is you're looking for, but you can create a Firefox account so that if you wanted to sync your browsing history across your devices, so if you left off, if you went to Amazon today on your laptop at work and then you got home and you wanted to finish up what you were doing on your um, computer at home, then, it, then it's seamless. So you, we do require an account for that, but again, we collect bare minimum. I don't need to know I don't need to know your physical address in order to provide the service, so why should I ask you for it? We don't want it. Um, I, don't I don't need to know your birth date. I don't need to know where you were born. <laughs> I don't need all of that information. So we collect only what we need in order to make that particular service function if, you're, if we need you to create an account. Um, in, in terms of the sharing piece of it, um, I feel like sharing is often a loaded word. There's this notion of sharing for wink, wink, selling, or doing something else with it. But there's the notion of sharing it with vendors who help us provide the service for our business models. Um, and so we do share our personal data with service vendors, but we have contracts in place. And we have a lot of limitations around what they're allowed to do with it. Specifically, you can only use it for the purposes of providing us the service, which allows us to do our business. Um, we have things like they're not allowed to correlate that data um, with other data, they can't create profiles of users try, you know, trying to put this all back together to this to codeorgs.org's um, point. So we also include those very strict limitations about what happens with our data, including when they're required to get rid of it. Um, and so that's all very much laid out, and that's what we, um, we force them to follow when we engage with a vendor through our vetting process and when we come to a contract execution point with them. Great. Eli? Yeah, just building on that last point before I forget, um, this is one of the things that has changed in the last couple years in the agreements that we have been having to sign with districts in a way that's really positive, where I feel like there wasn't a strong understanding of what a vendor meant. Um, and so, for example, the early contracts that we had to sign, um, and we couldn't because it wasn't true, was that like, we knew that every single person who could touch our data at a vendor had gone through the same privacy training that our team had. Or like, we, like everyone else, store our data in Amazon Web Services. Um, and I don't know every single person who works there. I haven't shaken all of their hands. We don't have written agreements with them. And so um, it started to move in a way that's been really positive of coming to an understanding of which vendors um, are allowed to have your data uh, and also those vendors becoming kind of familiar with the requirements of FERPA and, and COPA and I assume similar things in other industries. So 
That's been a really nice trend. Um, there's two categories of data that we collect uh, in addition to the ones that were mentioned here, and I think we probably all, all do. Um, so one of them is this kind of anonymized aggregated data that actually accomplishes most of the things that company claim, companies claim that they need um, personalized, uh, identifiable information for. So for example, we wanted to redo our keypad. We wanted to know which keys students were using. And in any given day, um, we've got a few million people who use our service. Um, and for all of these, I'm sure it's many more. And so we could, without knowing anything about the user, say the X button is pressed two million times an hour and the Y button is pressed um, four million times an hour, let's put the Y button first. And, and I'm sure that you do similar things. Mm -hmm. So that kind of data is great, no cost to the users, and a great way to make sure um, software continues to improve. And then the last one um, is similar to with code.org. Uh, some of what we do is we have these classroom activities where a teacher can see what all of their students have done. And for that, it's absolutely essential that we have a name attached to the student. Um, in classrooms where the teacher is worried about that, we let students type in a pseudonym and the teacher knows who it is anyway. Um, and so making sure that we collect the data so that a teacher can see the learning that is happening is critical in education. And in fact, um, that's data that, according to FERPA, we don't even own. That's owned by the school and it's owned by the district. So um, we have to make that available to the teacher and we have to make it available to the district and to the parent at their request. Okay. Um we are being told to <laughs> go to the Q&A. I just have one last question. Um, if uh, any of you would like to weigh in on this, um, can you talk a little bit about whether non-ad-based, uh, or what ad-based models can do to adopt some of the policies that you guys thought about in, you know, in designing your products? Anyone? I'll do a very quick answer, which is transparency. Mm -hmm. that's, that's a very obvious thing that anybody can and should be doing, rather than whether you're doing ad-based or not. That's just a very quick answer. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Eli, do you have one last thing to say about that? Uh, yeah. Yeah. So um, <laughs> a couple thoughts. So one that I thought was really fun, um, a New York Times piece in Digiday after GDPR, where they decided to stop doing identified advertising and instead tie it to the content. And they found that um, their revenue didn't drop at all and, in fact, went, went up. And the quote from that I thought was so great, which is they say, rather than bombard readers with constant notices um, about consent uh, or risk the user experience, we decided to drop behavioral advertising altogether. And this is such a great example of policies and regulation making it so that the costs to users that are invisible mm -hmm. of your data being out there become something that is costly to the provider um, that encourages better behavior. So I thought that was a really fun and say, did you, did you want to say yeah, that? I would, I would do a short plug to like think about where your users are going to be surprised. If you, whatever service or product you're offering, uh, if you are doing something different that is part of your ad-based model or your revenue model, think about where those users are going to be surprised and make sure that that is where you focus your transparency efforts and your explanations so that people actually understand what you're doing and what they're signing up for. Um, and with that, um, do we have any questions? Sure, go ahead. Thank you. Under 13, but what about the fact that a lot of children do not tell the truth about their age when they're getting on apps, not necessarily in the classroom, but other apps? So um, are you aware of any future privacy protections that will be put in place or ways to prevent this? Just general comments about that. That's tough. Yeah. yeah. Um, I know, what, you know COPPA, for example, says you can't... Uh, specify that 13 is the age when you're signing up, right? Like making it a little bit more challenging for kids to get around that system, although they're smarter than that. Um, so my view is uh, it is the uh, school's uh, responsibility, it's our collective responsibility to teach students about privacy and data in, in schools within the, the walls and the structure environment where they can grapple with these very tough issues and have a teacher guide them and be able to teach them how to do it responsibly and how to do it right. Uh, and so um, we, if there's things that are gonna be changing, that would be great if we can find ways of uh, getting kids to not you know, get around the laws. Uh, but uh, I think to some degree we can't fix all of this with just regulations. It has to be uh, upon uh, us and our education system to ensure that 
uh, students, when they are faced with these kinds of things, know how to handle themselves. Uh, a couple, couple things to add. So two um, fun things in COPA. Uh, one of them is that it requires that if a student enters an age under 13, they're still allowed to use the service um, to make sure that there isn't this incentive for students to lie, um, which many companies don't do right, but it's intended to get at this problem. Um, and the other is that COPA doesn't protect you if you have that gate, but it's still clear that your service is targeted at younger students. Mm -hmm. So if it's got art that really is intended for a 10-year-old and you're claiming that it's intended for a 16-year-old, that doesn't work. So for example, our graphing calculator, which isn't that interesting to someone under 13, we can treat really differently than our four-function calculator, which is. And for that one, we, um, we hold ourselves to a much higher standard because COPA um, also has that same kind of requirement. That's a great, that's a good point. We do the same thing where our product changes based on the age and you still can access the product even if you're under 13. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Right there? Right there? <laughs> how, especially for the Wikimedia Foundation, how do you address kind of different uh, elements around privacy in other cultural norms? So the European Union, for instance, has very different regulations around the right to be forgotten and GDRP and all of that. And so how in an international context do you kind of address these privacy uh, norms and concerns? Sure. So one of the, the cool things about our projects is that they are so heavily community run and every different language gets to set a lot of their own policies. So for example, if you are, um, sort of a non-privacy example is like if you are editing in French, uh, they don't allow fair use copyright images because most French speaking countries don't allow that either and they want people who speak French to be able to use everything that's on the site. Whereas in English, they do allow fair use, which is allowed in some way in many English-speaking countries. Um, and so similarly for privacy, if you are working on Wikipedia and you're working in a language that has a lot of European users, the odds on bet is that most of their policies around what should be in articles and how different users should be treated uh, are going to match the norms of the people in those countries. Uh, and so they're able to help people out. And there's also like, even if something isn't quite working for you, there's a lot of experienced volunteers that actually make themselves available to like help answer questions and assist people that are running into problems. Uh, so there's a bunch of different layers of, of ways that you can seek help uh, on Wikipedia if you're running into a problem of some kind. And I can add on from, um, so at Mozilla, what we do is um, we apply the highest bar globally. So we don't regionalize our products necessarily. We might, might localize for language, but everybody gets the same experience. So if there's a EU right, we apply it to everybody. It doesn't matter to us where you are. So if you want to delete your stuff, you can delete your stuff. I don't really care where you are. Um, we're just going to apply that across the board. And so with CCPA coming into effect in January, um, that's also, we're looking at, say, what are the bars? So is CCPA slightly higher, perhaps, than GDPR and something? Then we're going to apply that higher bar, and that's what everybody will receive. I think we had a question over here. Uh, Leon Hemovich, uh, father of three homeschool children from Santa Cruz. And my question is about the role of morality, integrity, and privacy. Because what you were speaking about were technical means, legal means, and uh, it's still in the context of morality, right? I understand it's a very difficult question, but maybe you have some thoughts about it. I can take a stab at it on okay. the side. Right. So um, I think Wikimedia mentioned this earlier, but we think, ethically speaking, um, this notion of no surprises is really important. People shouldn't, you go to the store and you buy a package of whatever and you open it up and you expect that to be inside the package. I don't expect it to be something completely opposite. It should be the same with your technology from our standpoint. So if you go to use something and we tell you this is how we operate, then that's how we should be operating. That is the right thing to do. And we shouldn't be taking more than we need for what you're giving to us. This should be, a, this should be an even exchange. You should be receiving a benefit that's commensurate with what we're providing you. Um, and so that's kind of how we approach it. And we think 
that's just fair to people. And it was like that long before this became a discussion about generally how does tech treat people. So that would be our two cents, I think. I think we have, okay, there you go. Go ahead. <laughs> Edward Snowden. Mm -hmm. So I'd be interested in the assessment of the, pa uh, of the panel. What impact have the Snowden, et cetera, revelations had on what you do, good and bad? Um, so I can certainly take a, an initial stab at that. Um, we, we sued the NSA after that came out um, and basically w looked at that and said that we really thought that this was something that would <laughs> impact people who wanted to read Wikipedia. Uh, both in the United States and around the world. Uh, and so we actually filed a lawsuit against the, the NSA um, on the basis that one of their, their programs, the upstream surveillance, was violating the United States Constitution as well as some of the laws. And that's, that's still an ongoing lawsuit. There's actually, uh, I believe, a hearing happening either uh, today or tomorrow uh, in the appeals court for that. So that has been going for some time. But we saw that kind of practice by the, any government as something that really uh, threatens the ability of people to participate freely online and to seek out knowledge. And so we've tried to take steps to um, respond to that. We, we've also tried uh, in the intervening time to you know, further improve our technological security, to add more encryption where we've been able to, to add it so that it's harder for people to be spied on. Um, and on that note, we're going to have to end the panel, <laughs> but um, I think some of these panelists will be on hand if you want to hear uh, what they have to say about, about how Snowden has affected <laughs> their work. Thank you very much. Thank you.